This is Algebra 2, Unit 2, Lesson 6 on inverse functions. Inverses are very important in mathematics. Um, we use them a lot for a lot of different things. The basic operations, for example, are inverses. Addition is subtraction. One undoes the other. What you add can also be subtracted to undo it. Same thing with multiplication and division. So functions can also be reversed by using what's called inverse functions. Okay, let's look at these two linear functions. We have f of x is equal to 3x plus 7 over 2, and g of x equals 2x minus 7 over 3. All right, let's calculate f of 5. So that means for f of 5, we're going to plug into the f function the value x equals 5. So 3 times 5 plus 7 divided by 2, which is 15 plus 7 is 22 divided by 2, which is 11. Okay, and then g of 11 is the other thing we want to do. g of 11 is 2 times 11 minus 7 over 3. So that's 22 minus 7, which is 15 over 3, which is 5. Okay, all right, now notice what we have here. f of 5 is equal to 11, and g of 11 is equal to 5. What do you notice right here? These two functions, this input gives you this output, which becomes an input here and comes back to the output here. So these are an interesting pattern. Huh, I wonder if that will happen again. f of 0 and g of 7 over 2. f of 0 is 3 times 0 plus 7 over 2. Uh, zero, 3 times 0 is 0 plus 7 is 7 over 2, which is 7 over 2. And then g of 7 over 2 is 2 times 7 over 2 minus 7 over 3. 2 times 7 over 2, the 2's cancel. That just gives you 7 minus 7, which is 0 over 3, which is 0. Huh, look at that. f of 0 is 7 over 2, and g of 7 over 2 is 0. They reverse each other. Look at that. Huh. All right, now we can also do this with different notation. If we have f of g of negative 1, g of negative 1 um, is done first in composition. So g of negative 1 is 2 times negative 1 minus 7 over 3, which is negative 9 over 3, which is negative 3. And then take f of negative 3 because that's what g of negative 1 is, is 3 times negative 3 plus 7 over 2. Negative 9 plus 7 is negative 2 over 2, which is negative 1. Look at that. g of negative 1 is negative 3, and f of negative 3 is negative 1. You can see that one input gives you the other's output. All right. So think it's going to happen with f of g of 5? Let's see if it does. g of 5 is done first. So g of 5 is 2 times 5 minus 7 over 3, which is 10 minus 7 is 3 over 3, which is 1. And then f of 1, because we take this and plug it in, is 3 times 1 plus 7 over 2 which is 3 times 1 is 3 plus 7 is 10 over 2, which is 5. Huh. G of 5 is 1, and f of 1 is 5. All right. So that shows us a pattern. The inputs of 1 gives me, the out, uh, give, gives me an output, and that output, when you input it into the other function, comes back to the original input. So without calculation, determine the value of f of g of pi. Well, every single time that we've done this, the input becomes the output, and then it becomes the input of the other, and it gives us back the output. And notice that these are the same, and these are the same. So the input of one becomes the output of the other. So what do you think f g of pi is going to be? Well, it's going to be pi. Now, this works because these two functions are inverses of, other, of the other. One undoes the other. So 
we will be looking at certain functions that are inverses later on and how to figure out what the inverse is. But for our purposes today, we want to figure out what an inverse actually does. Okay, so this is a graphical look of what we just did. The two functions in, in exercise one are inverses because they literally undo the other. Okay, so let's look at the mapping here. We start out with the domain of f, which is value a. If we plug a into the function, we get b, which would be the range. Then b becomes the domain of function g, that would be the input, and plug it in and it becomes the output will give you back your a. So when you, the input of f becomes the output of g, becomes the output of g. And the output of f becomes the input of g. All right, so when you see each one of these values for a function, a, b becomes b, a. So that's what happens when you have an inverse. One becomes the opposite function. So if the point negative 3, 5 lies on the graph of y equals f of x, which the following points must lie on the graph of its inverse? Well, if negative 3, 5 is on this function, what point must lie on its inverse? Well, let's see. The input becomes the output. So if we start with negative 3, 5, for the inverse, the input becomes the output. So negative 3 becomes the y, and the input become, or excuse me, the output becomes the input. So this would be 5, negative 3. So you can see here, x becomes y, and y becomes x. So this point would be uh, number two. Whoops, that's not right. It wouldn't be number two. I looked at the wrong sign. It would be number three. It's this one right here. Should be number three. Sorry about that. Now inverses actually have their own special notation that's shown here. If a function y equals f of x has an inverse that's also a function, we represent it as y equals f with this little negative one up here. That means inverse. So this is read as f inverse of x. All right, so let's take a look at an inverse on a graph. The linear function f of x equals 2 thirds x minus 2 is shown graph below. So this is 2 thirds x minus 2. We want to use its graph to answer the following questions. All right, now we want to evaluate f inverse of 2. All right, so f inverse of 2. Now, if we're looking for f inverse of 2, 2 is the input of the inverse. What was it on the original function? It was the output. Okay, so when we're doing the inverse, xy becomes yx when we do an inverse. So if we think of this one right here, we want the input to be 2 for our inverse. So where was the 2 on the original function? It was the output, so it would be here. So we want to figure out the point on this graph where y is 2. Well, where is y2? All right, y is 2 at this point right here. So what point is this? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2. This is the point 6, 2. So this would be 6, 2. So if this is 6, 2 in the original function, the inverse switches the x and y would become 2, 6. So f inverse of 2 is 6. It's a little confusing, I know, but you've got to think around um, what an inverse actually does. All right, f inverse of negative 4. f inverse of negative 4, okay? So if our input here would be negative 4 for our inverse, where was it originally? It was the output of y. So where y is negative 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, it's this point right here, and this is 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, so this is negative 3, negative 4. 
So that makes f inverse of negative 4, negative 4, negative 3. So negative 4, negative 3. Okay, so x becomes y, y becomes x. All right, determine the y-intercept of f inverse of x. All right, let's think about this for a second. What do we know about y-intercepts? Well, when you have a y-intercept, one of the coordinates is going to be 0, isn't it? It's going to be, the x-coordinate is going to be 0. So, if we want to figure out the y-intercept, the x-coordinate have to be 0, that means that for the original function, f of x, 0 was the y value. All right, so let's look at our function here and figure out where the y value was 0. The y value is 0 right here. This is the point 3, 0. Okay, so it's 3, 0. So the y-intercept of f inverse of x is equal to 0, 3. All right, now let's plot these points that we just figured out. All right, so our new inverse would be the point 2, 6. 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then negative 4, negative 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3. And uh, 0, 3, the y-intercept. 1, 2, 3. And look at that, we have another line. All right, let me draw my line in here. I'll do it in blue. All right. So when I draw my line like this, okay, this would be the graph of y equals f inverse of x. Now, what do you notice about these two graphs? Well, they look exactly the same except One's going up, one's going down. Any inverse is actually a reflection over a certain line. It's a reflection over the line y equals x. Let me draw in the line y equals x. Um, I'll do it as a dotted line so you can see it. The line y equals x goes right like the, through like this. It's the one that divides the uh, quadrants in half. If we fold this onto this, you can see that the inverse, if, the, if it's a function has an inverse, it's a reflection over y equals x on this one. So if this inverse is a function, it will reflect over the line y equals x. All right, for this last function, See if you can figure out what the graph of this function is going to look like, and we'll talk about this on the last, in the next class.